on too. Um, a lot has happened since then. You are working on a ton of stuff right now, mm-hmm. uh, which I definitely want to get into. A lot of projects going on. But let's start. Um, let's just tell your story a little bit about when you were a kid and you mm-hmm. were sick and all that, and kind of what led to you. Sure. So the the sick as a kid started around second grade, which uh, in hindsight is about when I stopped eating my mom's food and started eating the food at school. Uh, and I started with migraines, uh, really bad migraines that would cause me to start vomiting. And, and as a kid in school, if you were and sick. Wait, just so, so for some context, what was your mom's food? Mediterranean food. Yeah. Yeah. So all like f- seafood. There was no Snickers. There was no white bread. There wasn't any of that kind of stuff. There was no okay. pizza. We weren't allowed to have fast food. Okay. So I would sneak it at my friend's house like, yeah. oh, I want some of that. But that was taboo. And then in second grade, I would be able to have some school lunches. And that's when I started to get sick. But I did, obviously didn't put that together at the time. Right. Um, but it, as a kid, if you're sick in school and you don't have a fever, they send you back to class because they think you're making it up. So it was feeling like crap, and then I also felt betrayed and not trusted by mm. the adults around me. Uh, and the headaches were there all the way through 24, and they would get worse and worse and worse, so much so that I would vomit until I would black out from dehydration uh, and then be sent to the hospital, and there they would give me things for the pain, things for hydration, um, and I was always told it must just be the elephant in the room. We don't know what causes your headaches. And at one point, a doctor said that I was I was making them up. Not that I was lying about the pain, but I was manifesting these these migraines and try to prescribe antipsychotics. <laughs> so so when, when you say the headaches were there all the time, literally all the time, like twenty four hours a day. I had a headache every day, That's and great. then I would have For a like migraine. Plus years. Yeah, and then I would have a migraine once or twice a week, and I'd do an ER visit like once a month when it would get really bad. And the, the first day I woke up without a headache, it felt like weird, almost like it was a trick. So I was like shaking my head around, like is the headache gonna come back? So that was the headaches, and then skin issues started in junior high with hives. You could touch my skin. And then the handprint would raise up into a hive. Um, And then hormone issues that, because, you know, you start your period at a certain point. So that was also being affected. And all of that was my baseline normal. And I just accepted that that was my normal. Mm. And then went about my day. So I never wanted those things to How did that impact you, like, socially and, like, your ability to sit in school and get work done? Well, I would would get it done until I could not no longer possibly do it. So, like, I played basketball. and, uh, And I would have a migraine. But I had a game. So my coach knew about my my migraines and I would be sitting sideline with the thing wrapped around my head to like get the pressure going. And then I would tap her when I was ready to go in, take the thing off, do a couple minutes and then look at her and she'd call me out (laughs) because I'm not going to let it get in the way. Um, It definitely affected as far as like I would joke that I was allergic to food because every time I would eat, I would get sick. So. I've always I, I remember saying, oh, my stomach hurts. Oh, my head hurts. And then it just was just a normal part of my language. Yeah. And I, I'm sure people didn't take it so seriously after a certain point. Uh, dating was difficult. I remember there was someone I was dating during my head, my headaches. And then I saw them afterwards. And I was like, remember when I was sick all the time and like I couldn't go to things or I'd fall asleep at a comedy show. Yeah. <laughs> now I know why. Sorry. (laughs) Uh, And then in corporate America, because I went into corporate America and I was still a teenager. I'm a high school dropout. I went straight into corporate America and was sitting by a desk. And my desk was surrounded by all these people that were 15 years my senior with college diplomas and big quotas. And not only did I have to be as good as them, but I had to be better than them in order to earn my seat there. So I would sit there with sunglasses on because I had a headache yeah. and would just deal with it or like take naps under my desk um, because I didn't want it to affect me in any way. And if you take a sick day, they're like, oh, did a boy break up with you? Like they're, they're not like you're sick, that type yeah. of thing. I remember there was – so I've, I've that whole time I was always seeing doctors for different issues going on and they would do experimental um, treatments. So I was on these uh, these steroids for the hives and I just remember being so dizzy and so sick that I fell asleep underneath my desk, um, and it was it was gnarly. When I woke up, I was swollen. I looked like a watermelon. And my colleague, his name is Mark, we called him Meatball. Meatball's like, you got to go home, man. This is not okay. Yeah. Uh, so I stopped taking those. Um, so all of that was just kind of normal. And then I have, I mean, I have other 
trials and tribulations that were going on as well but i just i know i always showed up no matter what and no matter how i felt and then when i was 24 or 25 um I was at the hospital. They were about to give me another injection of morphine for, or an IV of morphine for the pain. And I was just really like sick and tired of it. I was like, I don't want to treat it anymore. I want to know what's causing it. And I like pulled out the IV, like I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then started doing research. So I came across a Ted talk by Dr. Terry walls, all about the mitochondria. And I think I told you this last time it all made sense. Suddenly a light bulb went off. Cause I had done a, a report on the mitochondria in high school and uh, rewrote the words to a Beastie Boy song to, like, as my presentation. <laughs> and it, I almost felt stupid, like I already knew about supporting the mitochondria. I like dedicated a whole year to studying it. Yeah. What a dumbass. Um, and so when I started to adjust my diet, I started with just removing gluten and using just goat milk as the dairy. And I saw a lot of changes with that. But okay. as I was already making those changes, I also sent out my own lab work. Uh -huh. So they had done blood work for gluten sensitivity, came back negative. And then when I learned about all the stuff that's more current, I learned that blood tests are 60% inc inconclusive. So then when I sent out my own lab work via stool and cheek swab. Um, that came, I was expecting to come back gluten sensitive because I'd removed gluten and I was feeling better, but it came back that I was actually a celiac, which is a little more serious about it. And also intolerant to casein, which is a protein in dairy and then soy. So I already made the shift kind of, and then I got that definitive, these are your issues. And I was so pumped Yeah. and just went all in. And within a few months of that, everything that ever bothered me physically, at least, went away stool nutcase <laughs> uh and that's 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 the uh, what is that pixie say long story endless <laughs> right. so it's crazy though that like nobody diagnosed you as celiac earlier right mm -hmm. like for all those doctor visits and everything? sure especially in california yeah you would think that would be something a little more prevalent yeah I don't know. I got recommendations like you should be vegan. You have lupus. You have cancer. You have this. You have that. I'm like, you guys are all nuts. Yeah. Those things don't run in my family. We've got other issues in our family, but those are not it. <laughs> so, so what happened when, when they thought you had cancer? Um, They wanted to do scans. They they said, you know, I said, what does that mean exactly? And like, well, we don't know. It just, you know, it, it could be something hidden. That we've got some growths here and there. I'm like, those could just be cysts and not necessarily have to be cancer. Yeah. Um. What was, was your diet and your intolerances and uh, everything causing like gross and cysts? And yeah. 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 I would always have like lumps and it would freak me out. Yeah. And, and then after changing my diet, the cysts went away. Yeah. Gross on your, your ovaries, your whole entire reproductive system. So w was there a point when, when you started to get healthy where obviously you're kind of rejoicing and like you're excited, but was there a point where you were like, fuck, like I wasted like all these years no one could tell me that were you kind of like angry and resentful and bitter at all no 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 You're just like this is awesome I'm yeah really feeling better yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i that's think that's people's most response because around the same time i had a couple of friends who found out they were celiac mm -hmm. and they were crying and like so upset and i'm like are you kidding me like we have an answer what right. what the i don't i i think maybe i don't know if that's innate like your your relationship with food or or just yeah. i want to feel bad but it, it was such a difference in response i was yeah. pumped i mean I, I don't mean that you were mad that you couldn't eat those foods it just sure like, why did someone tell me this you know um no yeah because what is that gonna do right i t i torture myself in a lot of other ways that well thanks i hadn't thought of that till now so now, <laughs> now i'm like how would my life have been different had I not felt like crap all the time? <laughs> so you go on this new plan and, and you feel a thousand times better. And then so when do you decide, OK, I got to start sharing this with other people because you were in corporate. You work working in corporate America. Yeah. So go through that journey a little bit. It's, at the time, people noticed that I was feeling better and started to ask questions. So I started talking about it. Um, and then I always posted what I cooked before this to like my social media for my friends because I enjoy cooking. Um, and then it was changing. So things were being labeled gluten-free and paleo and that people would ask me questions in that light, but I didn't take it seriously as far as the profession is concerned. I was just more like, I look good. I feel good. <laughs> and, uh, and then somebody asked me in corporate America during one of our, we did corporate coaching. And so we were talking about numbers and deals. And then after that, they asked me, can you tell me about what you're doing with your diet? Cause I see such great changes in you. 
went through this ideology of I kind of backdoored into the word paleo. I was eating not eating all these ingredients at the same time paleo was becoming popular and that was an easier word to say. So I was like, oh, this is the ideology of paleo, but this is my paleo version of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then he's like, you know, I don't have time to do this. Why don't you just cook this for me? And I was joking, like, I don't cook for people. I manage multi-million dollar contracts. And he's like, well, I'm willing to pay a, a private chef this much. And I'm like, that's comparable. I live in San Francisco and you can be the richest, poorest person, you know, because yeah. your money goes towards the cost of living. So I saw it as like a side hustle opportunity. I was like, yeah, you know, I could do that on the weekends. And uh, a week later or two weeks later, I was getting my wisdom teeth removed. They were impacted and coiled around the nerve. So I had to be put under for that. And when I came to the oral surgeon was like, I'm so excited for you to be my private chef. (laughs) So apparently my subconscious, I had convinced myself it was private chef and was pitching myself. Really? So those are my first two (laughs) clients. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, so I did that for a couple. And now you hadn't had any real formal training, Mm -mm. right? Mm -mm. You were just... Just somehow you just you started cooking and you're like, oh, I'm great at cooking. Well, you start <laughs> cooking as a kid in yeah. your family yeah. and you understand food and flavor. Technique is really great. Well, you do. I don't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we could start now. <laughs> um, and technique is really great, obviously. I don't want to take away from the traditional path. But if you understand food and, food and flavors and layering, that's all that really, really you, you need. The technique is really for efficiency and you could learn technique if you want. Um, but no formal training, just really. But you just have to food. have some kind of innate ability and palate and like a, right? No. I mean, yeah, you have to have a great that, sense of smell. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I also think being exposed to more than salt and pepper definitely helps my repertoire. Yeah. Uh, I love food. As a kid, I would uh, grill a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and then melt the Snickers bar and dip that into the, the melt the Snickers bar. And that would be my snack. Yeah. And that's like, that's a lot of work yeah. for a kid to do for just <laughs> yeah. one meal. Right, right. But that's the kind of stuff I would make myself. Yeah. So well, again, like knowing that I couldn't eat certain ingredients, I just wanted to still enjoy food. So you're working in corporate America. You have your two, two clients. My side hustle. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it went okay for the first month and then month two and three, my body was just so tired because having so I was in sales marketing. I also did VC consulting. Um, I also did like volunteer work. I was exhausted on top of that. Mary, were you doing the side hustle because you needed extra money at the time? No. Or just because you were... It was fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was fun. Um, and who doesn't want extra money? <laughs> right. I'm a social capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But my body was like exhausted. I was yeah. I pulled over on 101 one evening and my, my, my jeans were drenched in sweat because I was super tired. And uh, so I decided that I needed to choose one or the other. And I've never hated what I did for a living, but I also didn't absolutely love it. Like I would, I remember there was one month I came in at 500% of my quota, really helped carry the team on the last day of the month. And my boss comes over and he's super pumped and I just don't care. He's like, we're going to go celebrate. I'm like, no, whatever. And he's like, what the fuck's wrong with you? I go, I don't know. I just don't care. He's like, please don't quit. I was a flight hazard in corporate America. I would stay places and then the day I wasn't happy would be the day I would resign. Okay. And all these different people that led all these teams knew that about me. If I'm not going to give you 100%, I'm just not going to be here. Yeah. Um, and he's like, just just don't quit. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I just don't want to really be here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I had to choose. I resigned. I went, Which I, I love, though. I mean, that's a great lesson for people listening. I guess. Like, why be there? Yeah. I mean, not everyone can do it immediately. Like, not everyone has that luxury. Like, okay, I don't like what I'm doing. I'm quitting tomorrow. But I think it's good to have in the back of your mind, like, I'm not passionate about this. This is not my life's work. It's not what I'm, what I'm meant to do. And we all have limited time. Yeah. So, it's, so many people just sit there and, and ride it out until they're 65. Like, that gives me, like, that. gives yeah. me anxiety just yeah. thinking about. And I think, like, uh, you know this, a lot of people in my life have died yeah. at a really young age. Most of my friends are dead. I have an ex that has passed away. Um, I worked in hospice. Uh, volunteered in hospice didn't work in hospice and um and that idea of if i died today is this the thing that i want to be doing right get make it makes my hands get clammy just like talking about it yeah um and the only way for me to honor those people that have passed away is to take their kindness their joy their enthusiasm and pay it forward in the work that i do and that's certainly not selling myself short and just clocking and clocking out for a living yeah um and so you can like whatever extra time you have use the first 
couple of weeks to plan something out and then use that extra time to lay down the, the wireframe and then so on until you build something. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a thing you dedicate all of your time to if that's not realistic, but at least having something that makes you feel good that you're working on aside from that. Yeah, even if it's just you're working on it a half hour, an hour at yeah. night. And yeah. So, so how do you make that transition so, so you finally go full all in? I started uh, personalpaleochef.com and paleopersonalchef.com. It was a one pager, just took some janky photos from my Facebook and put it on the site, uh-huh. put together some pricing, started a Yelp page just so people could find me if they're searching on Yelp for a private chef, uh, resigned. My boss told me, and I definitely knew this was going to happen one day. Um, I'm really like psyched for you. My CEO told me I would fail <laughs> and told me that I was making a mistake. And I'm like, watch me. Yeah. I, I love when people say that. <laughs> yeah. That's great motivation. It is. Yeah. Uh, and within a few months of doing that, um, and I'm not going to take away from like good timing as far as paleo being popular, I had multiple high, pro- high profile people reaching out to me to come cook for them whether it was meals for the week or if it was just a one-time thing for an event for like a group of people, but they were all notable um, and talking about me and really helping solidify that. And uh, two or three months into that of having those people, um, I got to do a pop-up with Michael Mina in San Francisco, which definitely made me seem really legit. Um, And I had the help of his, his staff. So basically I helped write the menu and then they did the heavy lifting for me and I sold out the room for a paleo fine dining experience yeah. and that removed doubt in my mind like am I good enough to do this um and then shortly after that I got pa- paleochef.com so so talk about you know anybody not anybody but a lot of people have a good product or a good service and so there's some you know kind of intrinsic factors that separate people who are successful like it wasn't just that you were not to take away from your food because it's amazing. Sure. I've, I've had it, but Thanks. what else were you doing? You know, what else do you think went into your success and growing it so fast? Like did the way you interact with people and like things like that. What I was, think the time in corporate America, especially in sales, definitely help with building a business and definitely help with the way I communicate with people. Um, I don't think anybody is exceptionally more important than anybody else. So because they're high profile, I'm going to talk to them the way I talk to you. If I think they're being an idiot, I'm be like, yo, you're an asshole today. Yeah. And that human interaction helps maintain those relationships. Um, I also think I always go above and beyond, remove the flavor aspect of it. I still carry a lot of insecurity. I was insecure growing up. I was never the best at anything. I wasn't the prettiest, the fastest, the smartest. The only thing I could control was how much value I would bring. So I am forever competitive about being the person that delivers the most valuable value in the room. So I will be unforgettable. I don't want to be forgotten. (laughs) So that drives um, the way that I show up, I think. I don't know. I I would pitch that question back to you. Why do you think I'm so awesome? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I mean, that's the thing like from the from the mi- minute you and I met outside the building the first time like mm-hmm. you just had this presence and that, this kind of warmth and you uh, I don't know like you just make people feel comfortable um, so yeah and then I, I do see you know watching from afar like what you do um, the personal touch and everything and, and also expose like like what you just said uh, people don't buy brands; they buy the person. Like, mm-hmm. and you expose your weaknesses and your fears and your insecurities and stuff like that. Like, that makes it more relatable too. Mm-hmm. You know. What? Um, so the first time we did this, yeah. and we had five minute interaction versus now. Yeah. Is there anything about me that you had kind of already had in your mind? She's going to be this one way, and then have changed any of those opinions now that we know each other? Um, I thought you would be more serious all the time oh my god i, I don't know why because i didn't like you know me i'm not huge into social media sure. so i knew you were coming on so yeah. I, I did my research but yeah. not a ton yeah and I, you present yourself you know uh i thought you were a little bit older than you were on it but not not because of looks just because of what you, come, <laughs> you know what i mean you know because you, we, yeah. we know friends yeah 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 your age that seem like they're 10 years younger, yeah. like 10 years younger you know what i mean so it was just the way you carried yourself that you presented yourself everything seemed super professional it seemed like you had not it seems like you have accomplished a lot for your age so there was that's just why i thought like oh maybe she's just serious and working 24 7 and then over the next few weeks when yeah. we got to meet each other and we're just hanging out <laughs> we're and definitely so not working that hard no, and just like <laughs> laughing all the time and humor and stuff like that um yeah like that that, that was a, a 
I don't know. I just think sometimes that's a misconception of people who are really successful and sure. accomplishing a lot. You think they're just fucking working and head down 24-7 and always serious. Sure. Which is weird because I've been fairly successful and I'm not like that. No. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I think that was the same the same thing that I thought of you, uh, that you'd be super serious and that uh, you wouldn't be as goofy as you are. Because you're <laughs> hella goofy. <laughs> and you're really warm and like you're a fiercely loyal person. Oh, thank you. And obviously, I wouldn't be able to like assume he's not not a loyal person with me, <laughs> but I didn't expect you to be so goofy and so warm. Yeah. And like, you've got your friends back to the death, and right. that's a really rare quality. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Um. So so let's talk a little bit more about how the business grows, because now you know again looking in from the outside, you're doing big things, and we're gonna get. So some people don't even know about some of the stuff you're doing right now, uh, which we can get into or not get into based on what you're comfortable with. Yeah. But, um. How does it start to grow, and, and then how do you finally introduce uh, a fat fudge? And stuff sure. Like that? Uh, so how I got PaleoChef.com is really important. Yeah, that, also, like a funny say. story too. Yeah. Um, I was pretty good URL. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was. Um, I was uh, in Texas for South by Southwest. I was cooking for um, uh, Tucker Max and uh, Kamal Ravikant and a whole bunch of those writer type folks like Ryan Holiday and all of them, and um, and I was preparing something in the kitchen actually ryan wasn't there ryan was at a different event that i cooked for Sorry, i always forget just, them all just, just quicker because people listening are, are going to be thinking the same thing like how in the fuck are you getting all these big name clients so fast like what else was it w were you asking for referrals it was all word of mouth was there anything else you're not telling us <laughs> no no it was, <laughs> it was googling paleo and they come um a tugger was an interesting one i guess so uh, there was a there was a a Kickstarter that I set up to fail on purpose once I realized that I didn't want it to succeed. Sure. And I think a lot of press around that got eyes on me. But most of these people have found me on Twitter. I'm really active on Twitter. Sure. I think Twitter is a really underused social platform. And so on Twitter, you, you could jump into a conversation with someone you otherwise wouldn't get to know. So if I saw them talking about something that I had interest in, sports food whatever i wouldn't jump in the conversation and be like hey i'm the paleo chef i would just yeah. jump into the conversation and have a conversation and and if you say something that's intelligent and of value they're going to be curious look at your profile they're going to look at your profile and see you're a private chef who doesn't want food yeah. and then oh, almost immediately i would get a, a message from them or their assistant about cooking so like almost everyone i mentioned including michael mina found me on twitter mm. Okay. Me just jumping into conversations. Yeah, I don't want to take a, a paleo chef is really powerful, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I mean I really wish I could talk about some of my other clients. A lot of my clients I have NDAs with. I work with some of the yeah. most incredible minds in the world, and it's so good to see people achieve that and be such good human beings. Yeah, that's the thing that I like. Good. <sighs> I don't have to sell out to be successful. Well, I think part of your success, too, is because you're really good at reading people. You're great around people. You're good at uh, – you just have this in intuition with people. And I, you and I have had conversations or been around certain people uh, where you just have this kind of feedback that most people don't. And, like, you just see things and hear things that most people don't, uh, which is interesting. And that's why you've been successful. And you can talk about a wide range of topics, and especially stuff that – guys like me are into like you're super into sports you're really into music you're just into fun stuff yeah like, so you're very evolved and well-rounded yeah think that's what, what i'm helps definitely too. dynamic yeah, yeah i'm not one-dimensional yeah no not at all. um and which is i guess that definitely plays to to an advantage in those in those settings yeah um so i was in the kitchen and uh kamal says to me why don't you have paleochef.com and i'm like oh i've checked it it's taken i, I there's nothing i can do and he's like, you really should get it. I go, right. I just told you I can't. <laughs> and he goes, just check it right now. Just do me a favor and just humor me and check it. And I check it. It's expiring that day and going to auction that day. That's and I got crazy. it at auction for only $500 that day. Paleochef.com. I would have guessed like 20 grand. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and then when I tell other people that story – uh, especially any of his friends, they're like, Kamal was up to something. That magic in his <laughs> hair. He's got this long silver hair that's over one eye. I'm like, uh -huh. that's just really weird. So had he not been like, check it today, I don't know that I would have gotten. And there's those moments where I'm like, God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that you? Because <laughs> that's beautiful timing and luck and opportunity. And 500 at the time, 
um it's not a huge amount of money but when you're just starting your business and you just left corporate america 500 dollars is a lot of inventory of like yeah. things to like traveling all that kind of stuff um so yeah i got paleochef.com which definitely helps if people are searching paleo chef totally. just on google paleo chef oh look there's actually a paleo chef i didn't get the paleo chef that pissed me off yeah. <laughs> um so having paleo chef and i did that for about eight months in san francisco and uh Cooking for athletes was my favorite, as you know, like sports. Um, but I wasn't, I don't know, I wasn't, I was that same thing where I don't feel satisfied with my 500% of quota. Mm-hmm. I wasn't feeling satisfied with San Francisco. And the Bay Area is my home. Mm-hmm. Um, and my gut just said it was time to go. I wasn't sure if I was actually going to make the leap and my friend uh, coined July or die. I'm getting out of here, July or die. And okay. I'm like, oh shit. So I put in my uh, notice to my rent controlled apartment in Pacific Heights. Oh. And uh, sold everything that I owned and um, left with no plan, nowhere to live, no decision on exactly where I would live either. So I went to Texas, hung out with a bunch of friends there for like a month and a half. Then uh, I did an ebook when I was out there. And then my my gut said it was time to go back to California. So uh, drove uh, across Texas with a couple of friends uh, out to L.A., Driving across Texas is not fun. <laughs> Just by the way, I uh, exited the 90 into Marina del Rey, met up with some friends that lived there, got some lunch and decided that I would just sign a lease in Marina del Rey and wow. slept on a pile of towels for the first few months nice. while I acquired new clients <laughs> down here. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What year was that? That was f- four and a half years ago. Okay. Um, yeah, that was probably not smart, but it worked out. My joke is still not homeless. <laughs> so then take us through some of the trials and tribulations and, and, and lessons learned along the way to get where you are now. And then and let's let somewhere tell us where fat fudge starts. Uh, trials and tribulations. Uh, so I, I put up a Yelp posting here. Okay. I still had my clients that, so I travel a lot for clients. So I still had clients that would fly me places out of LA. So that was helping keep the lights on somewhat uh, as I was growing the, the presence here in Los Angeles. Um, I was super chill back. I would like to be that chill again. I was super chill that that first year. I was beach every day. It was nice. Um, I think a lot of the challenges I had was I was introduced to um, successful people and then internet successful people really soon. Mm -hmm. And I got to see a lot of the yuckiness Mm. of that industry and the way people do business. And I would be told I need to do things a specific way related to online business and and i was trying to fit this in life business this tangible business yeah. into this online thing right. and feeling frustrated and not liking the intentions that were being put on on it so i got angry a lot and bitter a lot and um not finding the right people to hang out with made me pretty depressed too um and that was like about six or eight months of like trying to, to draw a line and say, no, I'm not going to spend time with these people. No, I'm not going to do it that way. This is the way I'm going to do it. It might be harder, but it aligns better with the way I'm building my business. Um, I think that was it. It was finding my identity and, yeah. and figuring out what, what, which way I was going to pivot. And um, I definitely made things harder on myself in the short term. But I was playing the long game as far as what's going, what kind of business am I wanting to build? Because had I done, had I done the things that was I was being told I need to do to build a this online presence, I don't think that I would have been able to acquire the types of clients I have yep. in this more exclusive side of the business. Um, whereas you need to talk about this client, you need to name drop this client, and I'm like, no, 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 no. That probably would have gotten me a lot of popularity which would have been great in one way, but it would, I would have lost the respect of the clients that I have. Yeah. Um, now, would you agree that it makes it easier to run your business uh, on a day-to-day basis and even run your own life when you have basic principles and rules? Like, here's what I will and won't do for my business. Yeah. Here's what I will and won't do yeah. for my own life. Like, have those that set of rules that you adhere to. Otherwise, you wake up every day and you're not really sure. Maybe yeah. I'll do this. Maybe I won't. You know? Yeah, it's your, the core, the foundation of, of your moral compass. and. If you strip away everything, I drew a line in the sand. Like, here's the line, and this is what I – even just with the online stuff, like my Instagram, here's my line. Here are the things I will talk about. Here are the things I will never talk about, and it makes it easier as to how I'm going to communicate. Here are the, the jobs I will take. Here are the jobs I won't take. That line is right there. And 
And that, that, that first year I had always had those. And then I lost it that first year, which made me feel like spun out. And then all I do is remind myself like, who, who am I? Um, and so that once I, I'm still, I'm still clicking into place even more and more now, just at a more rapid pace. Uh, so all that was happening for about a year. And within that year I was making, uh, I called it functional fudge at the time. So boring. (laughs) 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 So boring. I was making that for my professional athletes and, uh, it's tahini and butter based. Uh, and that was just had some other, uh, nutrients in there. But at the same time I was making the functional fudge, I had posted a recipe to Unicorn Fuel, which is a coffee that I put together for these other clients. It was a writer uh, and a musician and a CEO. I was making them Unicorn Fuel. They could not get into Bulletproof Coffee. They didn't like the taste of it at all. They really missed their lattes. I wanted them to have fat in the morning and I wanted them to have all these different spices. So I put together something called Unicorn Fuel, which is coconut, uh, butter if they do it, and then turmeric, cayenne, um, maca all these other things and uh that within the first year was voted as one of the top three coffee hacks of the year right underneath bulletproof and i'd only been doing it for less than a year and i was like oh look at me um and so that recipe had gone viral the functional fudge i hadn't really posted about um but i was posting pictures of it but not the details of it and and people were starting to get angry that i wasn't posting the recipe for it and i was like it's just two or three ingredients guys not a big deal uh and then one evening i was making something for myself called halawa or halva it's a middle eastern dessert and it's just honey and tahini you cook the honey at a really high heat and some bubbles you mix in the tahini then you put it in the fridge and over the next 36 hours it crystallizes into this really great dessert really? yes I'm gonna make that later. it's so good it sounds super super easy i think even i can make it. <laughs> you would think i messed it up in the process oh, okay. okay so I'm, I'm making that <laughs> okay. and i messed up the timing of the honey and i know that it's not going to crystallize it's going to be a fudge so it's okay. like oh fuck it took the whole canister of the unicorn fuel mix of all those spices and the chocolate dumped it in there made myself fudge the next day i'm eating the fudge and i'm like holy shit this is so perfect because if you take those three little things aside when i first started as mary the paleo chef the oracle sailing team wanted me to consult with them on food in the water Mm -hmm. on the water for the, the the guys and i was trying to find a goo replacement for them and i couldn't come up with anything better than grinding chia seeds down to a powder making a gel putting the nutrients in there and i didn't feel that was it was good enough for the moment but it's not what i wanted and i used to live on goo packets back when i was an athlete or even like when we go to Vegas, I don't use drugs. So I would have a goo packet on the dance floor at like 2 a.m. to like <laughs> rage with my friends. So all those things came together in that moment of eating that fudge. And I'm like, I did it. I made the replacement. And fat makes you fat. P-H-A-T. It's fat fudge. Da, 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 da. And so I posted that recipe. That recipe went viral. Um, and people were asking me to turn it into a product because people were posting pictures of the fat fudge in sandwich baggies that they were taking on runs. Um, and with zero knowledge and zero experience is like, ah, fuck it. We'll, we'll try it and see like, there's a lot of magic on the other side of fuck it, as I say. <laughs> so I'm like, let's see what happens if I make a business. And I, uh, I, I bought an Amazon heat sealer. I got the little plastic thingies and made the actual packets. And I, before I actually made them in my, I made a prototype and then I put on a unicorn head, turned on Periscope and, and posted to Instagram. I'm like, okay. There's 50 orders of 12 packs available for sale. If you guys want to buy it, they're available now. I did a quick Shopify website. I don't know what I'm doing. Go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and in an hour, that sold out. Just 50 orders. And uh, it wasn't the fact that it sold out. Is when I saw who bought it. There were all people that were notable that I didn't realize was actually following me. And then someone I really admire, Michelle from Nom Nom Paleo, she purchased. And I always talk about them. Like, I knew this would succeed when I saw that Michelle bought it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I hand-packed 600 packets. Uh-huh. And I did it again next Monday. And then again the next Monday. And the next Monday. To the point where it How was... How long does it take to hand-pack 600 packets? Three or four days. It's okay. fucking gnarly. Yeah. It's gnarly. Because yeah. um, not only am I batching it, I'm squeezing it with a ketchup bottle over a scale to make sure it's the right weight, yeah. heat sealing it, then packing it into the box, and then putting it in shipping and fulfilling it myself. And it's just in like clear plastic or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, and I've showed you the, the hand muscle, how much bigger it is. Yeah. So I did that every Monday, and it got to a point where it was selling out in under a second. It would be up Monday at 10 a.m., so in a second, people would be like, fuck this, is this a Beyonce ticket? Like I just, <laughs> I'm like, you know what, guys? The recipe's still public. Don't get mad at me. I'm like letting you get it no matter what. 
So I did that. Wait, were you selling it on Amazon or on your no, own site? No, just on my own site. Like through PayPal or something? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Shopify lets you do direct or via PayPal. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so about 10,000 packets later, I realized this is not a sustainable business model. Yeah. And so I was faced with, okay, I need to scale, find a co-packer. Found a co-packer at the time. The minimum was 50,000 packets. And uh, it was rough. This I don't have that co-packer anymore. I'm having some traumatic, like, memory right now is why I pause. And, uh, and so my options were raise money, get a loan, go on Shark Tank, all that normal stuff. I didn't want to do any of that. So I decided to ask my audience, like, oh, here's the deal. I don't know what I'm doing. So if you're comfortable with that and you're comfortable with me figuring it out, I need this many orders to fund this run. Um, it might take three months, six months, a year. But it's, if, if what you can guarantee from me or get guaranteed from me is that I will either issue a refund or you'll have a product. So put that up for first for pre-order and $90,000 in orders came in in 30 days, Jeez. which helped me kickstart the business yeah. without actually using Kickstarter or any of those things. Yeah. Um, and so then I just figured it out along the way and I'm still figuring Amazing. it out <laughs> along the way. So, so can we talk a little bit about what strikes me there is I know so many people that are held back from starting their business because the fear is that doing stuff like you just described looks unprofessional. It looks like you don't know what you're doing. I think it's it's endearing to people, and it's kind of like like people love those kind of businesses sure. and people being authentic and be like because you're like I really don't know what I'm doing. Like, I'm just yeah. trying this. I feel like I want to be part of that brand. Well, the reason and because then they can grow with you. Yeah, right? so, it's, yeah, I consider all of my customers, especially my early customers, they're my unofficial board members. Like yeah. they're without them, this wouldn't be possible. Without them asking me to do it in the first place, this wouldn't even be possible. Yeah. And I don't think anybody really knows what they're doing. And I gave them a guarantee. Like I'm not doing Kickstarter because I could get that and then never do anything with it and just take your money and run. Yeah. I told them telling you, you'll get your money back or you'll have a product. So there's a guarantee there. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I think, so to the person listening who, who's, who is being held back, do you think they should just do it? Just put, put shit There's out a so lot of magic on the other yeah. side of fuck it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just do it. Yeah. And, and start small. Like start like, I think a lot of, I think there are people that don't want to admit that they don't know what they're doing. And there are a lot of people who don't want to do the physical work. Right. So I definitely have a different type of passion and connection with my product because I physically made it and physically packed it myself. When yeah. someone tells me I can't do something, I'm like, did you pack 10,000 packets right, with your right, bare hands? Right. So I think a lot of people try to outsource that. And that's yeah. great. It's a little bit of a soulless business if you ask me. Yeah. So I mean, eventually you have to, to grow, like you're saying. 100%, but do you, do you understand beginning. that beginning right. portion? So if you have something you want to do, create the prototype on your own. Yep. And don't be afraid to lose a little money on that prototype and, and test the market. Test with your friends and test with your friends or friends. Yeah. There's You're so much more connected to it. And then also when you need to hire people and outsource, you can do a better job. Yes. Because you know if they're doing a good job. Yes. Or not. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 100%. And yeah, that's it's it's like Bob says, baby steps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so uh, let's talk about now kind of the evolution. I mean, Fat Fudge is taken off. It's in stores everywhere. Mm -hmm. Whole Foods, Erewhon, Sun Life Organics, Amazon, Snoopy Joe Thrive Rogan Market. Talks about it on the podcast. Yeah. I mean, a lot, lot of people. So yeah, it's, it's rad. It's become a huge thing now. And it's all organic growth. Yeah. It's super rad. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> so, so what are the next steps now? Um, so I was prioritizing vegan. Vegan was supposed to happen this month. But with with the uptick, so some stuff happened in my personal life this last year, which kind of slowed the growth down. It was still growing, but not as much as when I was super hands on with it. Um, and now with the uptick of pushing it on Amazon, I'm going to turn on advertising for the first time, pushing uh, out to the other regions of Whole Foods and Thrive. I was like, oh, shit, I don't have enough inventory for original. So there's another original happening right now, but with the new packaging design okay. um, uh, okay. and then vegan and then a coffee free, honey free version. Um, and then just slowly evolving from there. I'm for the first time going to possibly consider raising money because I'm finding that I've done all that I can. Yeah. And I was telling, uh, Brendan Schraub this when I saw them, he's like, you're doing this all by yourself. I go, yeah, it's not smart. <laughs> it's not smart at all. <laughs> and he's like, well, I respect you being a lone wolf. I'm like, yeah, but I, 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 if I want to really take it where I want to take it, I have to now realize that I can't be a one woman shop. I'm going insane. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, Again, don't know what I'm doing, so I'm learning about what it would look like if I took funding and the difference between angel and VC. And luckily, my my background in tech helps me understand that, but it's a different beast with food. Um, and then hiring people who know what they're doing that really help take it off. 
um, and then being able to spend more time with the other the other side of the business, the Mary the Paleo Chef, all yeah. the content stuff there. And so, how, how do you balance those two? Is that, is that a challenge? What is balance? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how do you even get enough done for all those? Like, you're, I don't, which is yeah. why, which is why I'm realizing that it's I I've come as far as I can. If I was only doing one thing, yeah, I probably could take it even a little bit further. Mm -hmm. But I would still need help at some point. But um, well, we'll speak to that a little bit because that could be the balance, right? Because like, I feel like if you only did one of those two things, you'd get burnt out. You wouldn't be excited, but. So doing both is kind of the balance where it, it is. keeps you excited. Yeah, right? I was telling. I think I told you this. Um, Having focused on fat fudge a lot and not being and fat fudge logistics and not being able to cook, I got really depressed. Yeah. I don't even care about cooking for money. I just like like creating a dish, even if it's just a bite and getting the juices flowing with like whatever music's on in the room. Um, and I was getting depressed and I never really thought that I was an artist until I realized I'm like, I'm sad. I haven't made anything like new or exciting. So doing one thing fills me up so I can keep doing the logistics because fat fudge is super exciting, but looking at orders and detaching them at ship station is not exciting. Yeah. And I shouldn't be doing that anymore. <laughs> Someone who knows what they're doing to make that efficient should be doing that. So that. That is the balance. And I still struggle with taking care of myself. Like, you know, I have some health issues. So like being sure that I have time off to like rest, being sure that the people that matter get to see my face. This is the longest stint that we've gone without having like a grouping of hanging out. So I'm pumped for the concert. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, but I do think ultimately balance is a lie. Definitely. Yeah. This and, and I don't know if I can go on a rant about that. People yeah. are like, you need more balance or be positive. And like optimism is part of my branding. I have product that says optimist, but without my pessimism and my negativity, I wouldn't be an optimist. So like, I'm not going to sit here and think I can have true balance. This yeah. is the life that I've chosen. Yeah. And, and if I had full balance, I'd probably be really depressed. Right. And so how do you talk, talk about maybe just some structure of your day, your week, how you get so, cause you get a lot of shit done. So, but you also make time for fun. Like we've had a lot of fun together and we, can, <laughs> and we will continue to do that. So how do you, like what are some of the rules of your day and your structure, maybe your morning routines or yeah. something like that? Well, I don't take calls or meetings before noon. Okay. Um, and the, the early, so I get up naturally um, anywhere between six and seven. Uh, the first 20 minutes is I stare at my dog. We have a little eye contact, a little connection. Um, and then I get up and do whatever it is I'm going to eat or drink for the morning, which does vary based on where my hormones excuse me, are Charlie and I go for a walk um, and then music gets put on and I prioritize the things that I need to get done that day. Um, but I group them by blocks of time. So because some people prioritize their whole day, that's mm -hmm. very overwhelming for me. Okay. So I'm like, this is what I need to get done in the next three or four hours before I do whatever the appointment is for that day. Cause yeah. I have meetings each day. And then once that meetings every day for the most part. Yeah. Um, whether like on the phone or physical meetings as well, either or. Okay. Yeah. And I view them as the same because they take the same amount of energy for me. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll plan out the next three or four hours and then I won't plan out beyond that until I'm done with those three or four hours. So I, I have to actually break it down into smaller components for it to be manageable and for things to get done when I plan out the whole day. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, these are the two or three things I need to get done. It doesn't actually get done. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work for me. Um, and then, so if there's a, and then I train, so I train three days a week with a trainer and then I do light stuff the other days by myself. So the days that I train, um, only emails get done before I'm training and then more of the heavy stuff after I've had my butt kicked by a trainer. And, uh, and what's happening in those hours could be anything from, um, emails, important emails to content creation, to email creation, to recipe developing, um, and then I do customer service emails before bed. Okay. And then, but y it seems to me you're always like, you're not someone who's not going to do fun stuff, as I mentioned. So yeah. how do you balance that? Cause it seems to me like I could call you anytime and be like, Hey, we have a super fun thing to do later. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Is so, that like, because you know, you get so much shit done in the morning or what, yeah. what's that? So like there was one time that we had something planned and, uh, and it was somewhat last minute and I was working up until you called me. And I brought my laptop with me. I sat on yeah. the curb, <laughs> used city Wi-Fi to send a contract. <laughs> then we went and had fun. And yeah. then as soon as I get back home, I'm, I'm checking on that stuff again. Yeah. So it's, it's just really like that block of time. And yeah. I'm working the second up until. Yeah. And then every once in a while while we're out, I'll be like, okay, any fires on my <laughs> phone? <laughs> right. 
um yeah you just you fit it in like I'm not doing that with 10 15 people I'm doing that with people that actually fill me up and make me feel good about my life yeah and that's that's important that's like it's vitamins it's medicine definitely so what's next what 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 new projects do you have in the works you guys it's almost the new year where it happened um so this new year um is uh i don't even know if i'm supposed to talk about this stuff all right well we don't have to talk about it yeah so just follow me on social media and as those (laughs) things get inked then i'll be able to talk about it but it's it's how can i talk about this in a creative way i'll be leveling up um and working on things that are tangible as far as like things that people can walk into or hold in their hands (laughs) um and there'll be collaborations with people that are a thousand times more experienced than I am and then really doubling down, tripling down on scaling fat fudge and um, trying, trying to actually incorporate more play. Cause I don't think I actually play enough. Mm, okay. I'm I, I actually do feel like I'm a little too serious these days. Okay. Yeah. So my original impression was right. <laughs> <laughs> That's because we haven't hung out enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, I, I find, uh, I find myself becoming a little bit jaded and I think it's a combination of knowing I have a task to do Mm -hmm. and then just getting beat down by the general stuff in life, like health and family and loss and all that kind of stuff and feeling like (sighs) this weight. Yeah. And, and that weight has always been there, but I'm carrying it differently. And so I'm, I'm trying to incorporate more play and I'm also trying to cut out anything that's not a hundred percent anything whether it's something i eat or somebody that i know if you are not if we're not like feeding each other in some way it's just got to go yeah 100 percent. so then that will help give me a clearer mind with the decisions i have to make moving forward in the new year um and there's a lot of lessons there too i mean you're you're showing that you're human everybody has that kind of stress and that weight on their shoulders but you're still getting shit done like i battle with depression a lot when i wake up when i open my eyes it's not like oh seize the day it's depression when i and i have to make a very active effort to switch those that thought process and if i don't do that work it gets really dark really fast Mm -hmm. Um, I, f- I forget whose podcast I was on. She's like, you know, I love how positive you are and, da, 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 and so great. And people need to be positive. I'm like, I got to cut you off, dude. I'm a severely depressed person. I struggle with it really, really bad. And it takes a lot of work. And I don't want anyone listening to think that it's like, just think happy thoughts. Like it's, it's more than just your thinking. It's the decisions you make the next step. How is this going to serve my well being? Yeah. And how is my well being going to serve the people around me? I don't, I say this a lot. I'm not here to teach anybody anything. I'm just here to show you a different way. Yeah. And if it resonates with you, let it work for you. And, and, and that's kind of the joke of like, without my negativity, I wouldn't be such an optimist because <laughs> it, it does take work and I want, I want it to be a little more natural, but if you have any struggle or demons in your life, those demons don't ever go away. Yeah. You just get better at tackling them when they do come. You're like, oh, I recognize this. I know there was going to take me, but guess what? I'm going to win today. I'm going to stare you in the face, and I'm going to win today. Yeah. So that's that. It's working more on that because this last year has been super tough. Well, see, I, I think that's what 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 I find impressive and inspiring about you when we hang out is because wh- most of the time you are super fun and whatnot, and we have a great time. We're always laughing, and I and because you've been so forthcoming and, mm-hmm. and upright about that, like I know some of the things that you battle. So that's why it's even more impressive. Like. And I know that you need your your your, your alone time. And whatever, and sometimes <laughs> you're like, all right, I'm out of here. I'm done with everybody. Um, but that's inspiring too. Like I think that should be inspiring to people listening because you know you you battle through that, and you n- people that hang out with you and we hang out would never know that. Right. And I get that a lot too. People are like I never would have guessed X Y Z, and I'm like, that's the point. I'm yeah. not going to be defined by it. And it's actually part of the reason why I don't talk about some of the stuff is like I don't want it to be the defining thing of my personality. Right. Like. Tell us again about that thing on this podcast. I go, no, no, no. Let's talk about cooking. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's it's uh, I, th- I also think that I get the kind of clients that I get because they must sense that because most of my clients, it's not just food. Yeah. We talk about so much more. Right. And, and it's an exchange of power and energy and support. And it's really, really, really cool to get them to share their truth with me. And it's it's usually like. 
I never tell anyone this. I go, it's okay. I'm used to this. Let's talk about <laughs> it. And then I'll share something. And then I go, I wouldn't have guessed that happened. And I go, right. But I, I, th I think that this interaction is more than just the plate in front of us. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the stuff that I think is the coolest about what I do. And we were talking about this before we started recording is doing more cooking for people, more yeah. like proactive cooking yeah. and being able to have those dynamics more. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. So, uh, just a couple quick tips before we go, like on just for people starting out a new business. You already gave them some, you already gave some suggestions, but, uh, maybe some social media tips, maybe some mistakes to avoid. And, um, can be more specific. Right, someone, <laughs> so, so, someone's right now they're working in corporate America. Okay. They're going to start selling something like fat fudge. Okay. They're going to start selling an ebook or something okay. like that. What are some steps that they should take online right now? Talking about it. Okay. Don't like, don't hold your cards until you're ready. Okay. Um, so if you have your personal Instagram and start one for the business, if you want to keep it separate, like if you have a corporate job, it might be taboo for you to start talking about a side hustle. So you think people should pick one form of social media. Cause I know that they're like, should I do eight, eight different forms of social? Like they get freaked out. Pick the one you're most excited about. Okay. So I don't even have a personal Facebook and I suck at my business Facebook okay. and I'm sure they're like, like the Gary V's are like, be on every platform. I'm yeah. like, no, homie, I'm not you. I can't do that. Yeah. So pick the one you're most excited to use. So you don't want it to feel like a chore. So for me, it's Twitter and it's Instagram. Okay. Um, especially now that Instagram lets you do things like video and, and stories. So you have different ways to communicate. Yeah. But definitely pick one you're good at. And um, and uh, this is going to be a personal choice, whether you want the brand to be by itself or if you want to be part of the brand. I definitely recommend being a part of that story and tell stories. So if it's still in the idea phase, still start posting about it still part start putting together lifestyle photos and telling the story of it so when you do have the prototype and then the opportunity to sell it it can start going and and longer form captions like be human and be weird just don't be weird about it <laughs> uh i think storytelling is really important which i'm sure we all know um and then once your social media starts to gain some traction um, and the ways to gain traction on social media is actually uh, to interact with other people. So don't post and walk away. Post and then go and interact with other Instagram accounts and other posts to, to start creating that connection. Um, and just don't don't be afraid to put up a splash page and say, fuck it. I've got, I've got a product. Who wants it? And then see what happens. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, tell everybody where they can follow you and find your stuff online, Fat Fudge, all that. At Paleo Chef on Twitter and on Instagram, paleochef.com. It's my online business card and where some recipes go up. And then Fat Fudge is Twitter and Instagram. And then fatfudge.com, P H A T fudge.com. Or you can find it on Amazon or Whole Foods. Or if you can't find it in your store, go to your manager at the store and be like, you need to carry this product. Exactly. <laughs> awesome, Mary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Guys, thanks for listening. And we will talk to you next time. Thank you.